Hello and welcome to Intermediate Financial Accounting 2, Tutorial 7b. This is the second of a series of two tutorials focused on accounting for bonds. This time we'll be looking at bonds that are sold at a premium. We have three learning objectives for this tutorial. The first will be to review accounting for bonds that are sold at a premium using the effective interest rate method as we did in Tutorial 7a. We will continue to review and apply present value concepts that are applicable to bonds and we'll prepare journal entries from the perspective of the bond issuer. This tutorial will continue with the Steinbrenner example. In this case, we're making a small revision to requirement two. We're still going to have to prepare the journal entries for Steinbrenner, but this time we're going to assume that the bonds were sold when the market rate was 3% and the redemption is at 98 rather than 102. As with tutorial 7a, we'll do the sale of the bonds on March 31st. We'll record an interest payment on September 30th. We'll record accrued interest at the end of November, which is the intervening year end. Record another interest payment on March 31st, 2022. And then the early partial redemption again at April 1st, 2025. We'll start with the amortization table. This is very similar to what we did in the previous tutorial with, of course, the changes around the interest rate. Bonds were issued April 1st, 2020, but they were not sold until March 31st, 2021. A whole year has passed, so two payments are gone. We're left with 18 payments, so 18N. This time, the interest rate drops in half. The yield rate is 3%, so we need to divide that by 2 to get 1.5%. The payment is still $140,000 because the face rate of the bond has not changed and the face value is still $7 million. Then with the redemption that happens on April 1st, 2025, we'll use the balance at March 31st, 2025. We can recompute this with 10N. We'll get seven million three hundred and twenty-two thousand seven hundred seventy-six. Forty percent are redeemed, so the value of the redeemed bonds are two million nine hundred and twenty-nine thousand one hundred and eleven. And we'll use that later on. Now we can go with our journal entries. So requirement A: sale of the bonds on March thirty-first. Again, as with the previous tutorial, I'm showing no entry on April first because the bonds are issued, not sold. On March thirty-first, a debit to cash and a credit to bond payable for $7,548,540 and again 18N 1.5 IY, 140,000 payment and 7 million future value. Requirement 1B to record the interest payment on September 30th. We will take the balance in the bond payable of $7,548,540 times 1.5% and that will give us 113228 our cash is always 140,000. And the amount to make the debits equal the credits, in this case is going to be a debit of 26,227. So what's going to happen here is we have 7,548,540 in the bond payable. And of course at redemption, it has to be 7 million. So we need a series of debits. So the first one will be 26,227. And this will keep happening until the bond matures. Next entry C, the year end interest accrual on November 30th. We're going to have to debit interest expense for 37609. Because we are taking the value of the bond from 7,548 to 7 million, we know that we're always going to have to debit the bond payable in this case. And we know that we're going to have to credit interest payable for the amount of the payment. So the payment's usually the easiest one. Again, 140,000 times two over six months because October and November inclusive. So that's two over six, 46, 667. We'll take the interest expense as being 7,521,768, which is 7548,540 minus the 26,227. Or if you look at the table, 112,827. And we're going to multiply that by 2 over 6 because that's the portion of the months that have transpired since the last interest payment. That's 37,609. The difference then is a debit to bond payable of $9,058. Our next entry, the interest payment on March 31st, 2022. 
we would take our 7 million 548 540 minus 26227 minus 9058 and that would give us 7 million 521 768 that times one and a half percent which is three percent divided by two times our four over six because we're looking for the other portion of the six months since the last payment date of September if you look at the table that's the same thing as 112,827 times 4 over 6, 75,218 debit to interest expense. Interest payable will always get the reverse of what previously happened. So we set up a payable of 46,667. Now we need to debit it. The cash is going to be credited always for the amount of the payment, the actual cash payment, 140,000. And the bond payable gets a remaining debit of $18,115. All right, we're almost done. The last one now has to do again with the redemption on April 2025. We need to figure out the balance in the bond payable account at the time of redemption. If you go back, you can look at the amortization table or we can take 10N, 1.5 IY, 140,000, 7 million future value and multiply that by 40% and that's 2,929,111. So that's the debit to the bond payable. The cash will be credited for the face value times 40%, this time times 98%, or 0.98 because it's 98% of the face value. And that gives us 2,744. The difference between these two to make our debits equal credits, in this case is a credit of 185,111, and that's a gain on the redemption of bonds. And that's it. So let's finalize with some points to remember. Some of these are the same as the previous tutorial, so it's just review. Again, bonds not always sold on the date issued. We record the bonds at their present value of future cash flows based on the number of payments that are remaining. That's a good rule of thumb because if you accidentally calculate the present value based on the total number of payments, you'll get it wrong because from this first point here, bonds are not always sold on the same date that they are issued. And then in this case, the present value is greater than the face value, so we have a premium. Once again, be sure to accrue partial interest at an intervening year end as well. At early redemption, calculate the present value based on the remaining number of payments. So in this case, we were left with 10 payments. And the difference between the bond carrying value at the time of redemption and the cash paid is a gain or loss. And in this case, we had a gain. And once again, the bonds that are unredeemed will continue to be accounted for as normal. IFRS requires the effective interest rate method to be used to amortize bond premiums or discounts, whereas ASPE allows for a choice between the effective interest rate and straight line methods. And once again, unless otherwise told, assume the effective interest rate method is the one to use. So this concludes tutorial 7b. If you want to review bonds that are issued at a discount, please refer back to tutorial 7a. We hope you found these useful.